chapter 15. John's Gospel on chapter 15. And we're going to read this morning again the first uh, 17 verses. John chapter 15 on on verse 1. The Lord Jesus is the speaker, and he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. Amen. And may the Lord bless his word to all our hearts. Last week we looked at this passage and we spoke about the two branches and the two outcomes. And last week we looked at the, the fruitless branch and we, we dealt with that in relation to the branches in the vine that are not bearing fruit. So this morning, I want to look at the fruitful branch, the fruitful branch. We see here uh, that in the study, as we looked at this passage, that the Lord Jesus, he says, I am the true vine. God's word spoke about those different trees. He spoke about the fig tree in relation to Israel the olive tree, and the vine tree. And we've seen that the Lord Jesus is the true vine. Verse 1, my Father, he's the husbandman, God the Father, and the branches are the disciples, are God's children. And so what we see as we look in this passage is that the Father is looking for fruit. The passage is to do, the main aspect of the passage is bearing fruit, prayer, and love and discipleship. And as we look into the passage here, we want to keep it in its context. And uh, we looked last week at the branches that didn't bear fruit, that it's the husbandman, the father's responsibility, and he purges those branches that aren't bearing fruit. And so, as I said, we're looking primarily this morning then at the fruitful branch, the fruitful branch. And remember now, those of us that are Christ, that were saved by the grace of God, you can't be a branch if you're not in Christ. So this verse is relating this scripture. It's speaking about the believer's relationship in the vine. Our relationship in the vine 
uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the father is looking here, the husband man, he's looking for fruit. Fruit is the evidence of life. And uh, if there's no fruit in the life, there's no evidence of life. And the Lord Jesus even teaches that in Matthew's gospel. He said, by their fruits shall ye know them. So as we examine the evidence of fruit, we'll see that there has to be the life of Christ uh, in the vine. And uh, so what is it that the Father's really looking for? Well, the answers are here, the fruit of abiding. The fruit of abiding, abiding in the vine. We see that in verse 4. He says here, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. So the abiding then is to abide in Christ. That's a daily relationship. Uh, the branch, it's a daily abiding in the Lord Jesus. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, the Lord Jesus speaks about one thing that we have daily to do as a Christian. And we have to daily take up our cross and follow him. He doesn't even say in his word that you have to pray daily. It says that men ought always to pray and not to faint. But he says we are to daily take up our cross, which is that uh, way it transfers. Is, it's that daily cross of discipleship, dying to self. We're to take up our cross daily and to follow the Lord Jesus. That's how we're to to abide in this branch, abide in the vine. And so it says here, if ye abide in me and I in you. We're to abide. We're to love the Lord. We're to love him with all our hearts. That's how to abide in Christ. If we love him with the whole heart. It's sad to say that not every Christian loves the Lord with the whole heart. And that's what the Lord requires of us. He wants wholehearted love. Not half-heartedness, but wholeheartedness in our love and in our devotion and in our relationship to the Lord. And as we look at this passage, we'll see here that how God uh, instructs us here. He says in verse uh, 15, uh, sorry, verse 10 of John 15. He says, if ye keep my commandments, there's th that little word again, if. It's conditional. It's upon you, not upon God. God hasn't changed. It's our relationship to him. He says, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. We also read it as well in 1 John 3 and 24 about if you love me, you know, keeping the Father's commandments. When we speak here about, about love, it's to live in his love. It's this constant fellowship with the Lord Jesus. I remember when I was first converted, first gloriously saved, I had such a love in my heart for the Lord Jesus Christ, that first love, that, that fresh love of that realization of I'm gloriously saved, what the Lord has done for me, the, the, the power of his risen person in my life, in my heart, that realization that my sins were forgiven. And I remember meeting Jackie Hughes one day in the Marks and Spencers, maybe about six months after I was saved, and they shout, that's the man who was preaching the night I was converted. And he shouts over to me, he says, Darl, how are you? And I shouts back, Jackie, I'm in love. And that's just the way it is. I'm in love. I'm in love with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And love is a natural. And it's not just about the emotional feeling here that, that Christ is relating to us in love. Love is more than a feeling. Love is a commitment. You that are married a long time, you know that in your marriage relationship, that 
fellowship of love goes, it's deeper than feelings. It goes just beyond the emotional. It's deep-seated and deep-rooted in affection and in devotion and consideration. And this is what the Lord is bringing out here, that our love for Him is more than this fleeting feeling because not every day you feel great. If, we're, if our love depends upon how we feel, we'll not feel loved very often. It's more than feelings. It's deep-rooted in Christ abiding in this vine and His love by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's God's Spirit, uh, the, the true vine that feeds the branches. It's the, the sap that uh, flows out to the extremities where the fruit is. It's, it's the power. It's the anointing. It's the life of Christ flowing through the branches that gives us life to bear fruit, the fruit of God's Holy Spirit in us. And so this love is this constant fellowship with the Savior, and that needs to be maintained. You need to maintain. You need to kindle your own heart. You need to put fuel on the fire. Don't let that fire out. You remember the old song they used to sing in the Second World War, keep the home fires burning. You need to put fuel on. You need to fuel and fan your life through prayer, through fellowship, through reading the Word of God, giving ourselves uh, to God's Word and uh, putting fuel on our souls. And so we see the Lord Jesus, He emphasizes quite a lot here on love. And He says in verse 12, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. And what I've discovered in Christendom today is that we don't really love one another, we tolerate one another. And that's a real tragedy. We are, we are to love one another, not just tolerate one another. We're to build each other up in our most holy faith. We're to be encouragers. We're to show our love, the expression of our love. We're there to help one another, to encourage one another, we're there to be, we're in this together. And the Lord Jesus, he says here in his precious word, to love one another as I have loved you. And then he goes on to say in verse 3, greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. The Lord Jesus is relating here to the disciples, this is how much I love you. Before this night is finished, I'll be arrested in Gethsemane. And I'll be going to the cross. And there you will see my love displayed for you because I'm going to die for you. This is how much I love you. Remember here, just back over a few uh, chapters, uh, in chapter 13 of John here where uh, the disciples were isolated and brought together where he instituted the Lord's Supper and so on. And there he took the towel and he washed the disciples' feet the act of a slave. This is God the Creator, God in flesh, taking the menial task of a slave to wash the disciples' feet, to display to them the servant heart, the love that he had for his children. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So he's encouraging here to love one another and to serve one another. He said, remember to serve one another as I have served you. The Lord Jesus, he's known as the servant king. He came not to, be, not to be served, but to serve, the hymn writer said, and to give his life that we might live. So here's what the Lord Jesus uh, is portraying to us. The father, he says, he's the husbandman. We're to abide in this vine. We're to love one another and we are to serve one another. And we are to live in obedience to his word. We are to live in obedience to his word. Again, he said, tell them away back in John 14 there and 15, he says, if ye love me, keep my commandments. There's that word again. If, if we were to take the ifs in John's gospel, it would be a great study. If ye love me. If ye love me, keep my commandments. 
Salvation is not about rules and regulations. The commandments of the Lord are not grievous and burdensome. It's a delight to serve the Lord. It's a delight to live in his word. It's not about keeping ritualistic, uh, you know, rules on the, the law. We live in grace. There was a great little illustration was shared with me there recently as a grandparent, and many of you can identify this. Whenever we're grandparents and the grandchildren come, they get everything they want practically. It's all grace, grace. You, you want another Mars bar? Give them another. Oh, no, we bought chocolate. Get an we bought chocolate. Nothing's too much trouble. You just love to give out. It's all grace. It's all grace. It's all grace. But when it comes to the parents with their children, it's all law, law, law. Do this. Do that. Do the other. You can't get this. You can't get that. You can't get the other. That's law. The New Testament is grace. It's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything we receive, it's God's grace. And the Lord wants us to treat each other with grace, not in law, in keeping ritualistic law. We are to be seasoned with grace and do it with grace. We are to live in obedience to his word. If ye, if ye love me, keep my commandments. And we're to live a fruitful life of witness and service. This is about fruit bearing. It's not about soul winning, although that's part of it. It's being fruitful as a Christian, being fruitful in your walk, fruitful in your witness, fruitful in your daily living. And uh, the Lord Jesus says here we're to live in obedience to his word. And we are to live a fruitful life of witness and service. John 15 and 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. I believe there are many that have just this head knowledge that needs to go down deeper into the heart. Without Christ, we can do nothing. We are helpless. We are hopeless. We are powerless, except we abide in the vine of Christ. Except the power of the Holy Spirit flow through our bodies, we can't live for him. We need his daily power, his daily provision, his daily grace, his daily help to live a fruitful life of witness and service. We are saved to serve. The Salvation Army had the two S's on their cups, saved to serve. The Lord has blessed us with this glorious salvation, and he wants us to share this wonderful message with others that we meet in our daily witness, a fruitful life of witness and service. And we are to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Abide in me, verse 4, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. So what is then this, this abiding? Well, to abide is to obey. It's the obedient heart. Abiding is to obey. To simplify it, if it was to give you a one-liner, as it were, to abide is to obey. Trust and obey, the old hymn says, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, only to trust and obey. Abide in me. So there's the challenge. Are we really abiding? And if we're abiding in the Lord Jesus, and the Lord Jesus is abiding in us by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, he will give us our sufficiency. He will give us our daily provision. He will give us what we need. And we see that the fuller teaching of this 
in Paul's letters in the book of Ephesians, where he talks about in Ephesians 5 and uh, 18, he says, Be ye filled with the Spirit. In other words, be ye daily filled, be ye continually being filled with the Spirit's love, with the Spirit's power, with the Spirit's anointing. Be ye continually being filled. And that's the process whereby we're abiding in Christ. And every day there'll be a daily filling for the daily abiding, for the daily needs. And so if we will abide in the vine, we are promised the supply that the vine needs. And you see, those that we looked at last week that didn't abide uh, in the branch, they dried up. There's a dryness comes into the life. There's a barrenness. And then the Lord has to deal with that branch. And then there's that, there's that cutting out. So we want to be continually being filled. And so to abide uh, in relation here, the Lord Jesus says, if ye abide in me and my words will abide in you, here's this in relation to prayer in verse 7, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. There's the fruitful prayer life of abiding in Christ. We'll see answers to our prayers. To abide is to be faithful in prayer. Verse 7, if ye abide. There's that if again. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you. We want to see answers to our prayer. We want to see the Lord working in and through our lives. We need to be in touch. We need to be faithful in prayer. It's so important. I couldn't emphasize that enough about faithfulness in prayer. If we can't be faithful in other things, certainly we can be faithful in prayer. Remember seeing a banner outside a Methodist church on one occasion, and it said, Seven days without prayer makes one week. W E A K, week. Yes, week in body, week in spirit, week in soul. We need to be faithful in prayer. And we need to be fruitful in prayer as well. John 14, on verses 14 and 13, says this. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. There's the if again. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. We want to see answers to our prayer. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, verse 13, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So the Lord Jesus is glorified when we pray and ask in his name, when we're abiding in the vine, and we'll ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus, he has promised, I will do it. God will answer prayer. He has promised that. He has covenanted that. As we abide in the vine, we'll see wonderful answers to our prayer. We'll have a fruit, fruitful prayer life. You know, that's a big challenge. When was the last time we, you, you seen an answer to your prayers? When was the last time you were specific about something and you got an answer to your prayer? That's a challenge to us, isn't it, this morning? We want to see answers to our prayers. We want to see God moving and God working, even in the little things of life, not just the big things. That's what encourages me at times about the Lord. It's the little detail where you see God working and God moving. Those encourages me so much. And then we see here as well, we're to be faithful, we're to be fruitful, and we're to be responsible. We're to be responsible. Again in verse 7, here's the condition. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. So there I see a responsibility upon me, a responsibility to pray, a responsibility on me to be in the vine, a responsibility on me to be in the right relationship with God, to be in the right relationship with my fellow believer, that I'm to love them as the Lord Jesus has loved me, 
So there's a responsibility for me here to abide. And that is obedience. We need to be obedient to God's word. You know, when God's word comes to you and challenges you, and uh, God's spirit would ask you to do something, if you don't do that, you'll not go any further. You'll stop, you'll hit a roadblock on your Christian experience. Because God wants us to step up to the mark and to obey the word that he has given to us in whatever area it is. There has to be obedience for a growing and a, and a moving on with God. And so there's a responsibility. All believers are responsible. And this is why the Lord Jesus specifically, if you were to, to pull out these ifs in this passage, it places the responsibility on the disciple, not on the Lord. The Lord hasn't changed. The Lord, he's, he's immutable. He's unchangeable. He's as true to his word today as he was then. The problem lies with us. We change. Uh, we get mood swings. We're up and down and people cut across us. There's all sorts of reasons why we're not what we ought to be. But if this word brings that responsibility, there's an obligation, a responsibility on you and on I as believers to obey in this vine and to obey. So there's responsibility, and I see as well here, there's accountability. There's accountability. Verse 6, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So there's the accountability. If we're not abiding, if we're not going to bear fruit, if the branch is dried up, then the husband man, God, that's his prerogative. He cuts that, that branch out of the vine. And you have the picture there of the branch being gathered up, cast into the fire, and they are burned. And we brought that out last week at the judgment seat of Christ where our works are judged. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. The fruit of our lives as believers will be a given account will be judged according to our works, our fruit as believers. This passage is not relating on salvation. It's relating about fruit bearing. Remember we brought out to you in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, where the believers, the Lord Jesus says, because of the abuse of the Lord's table, many of you are weak, are sick, and are asleep. And so the Lord cut them out. And uh, dear friends, we don't want to be in that category. We want to be fruitful branches. But the Lord has to be true to his word. And so we want to be responsible. We want to be uh, accountable. And then I see something else in this passage here. There's purging. Purging. And that's part of the ministry of the great husbandman, the sovereignty of God in the life of his children. So we have to be prepared for purging. Verse 2, so every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he takes away, but the ones that are left, and every branch, I love that word every. You know, if it just said some, you'd be wondering, well, why, why is this happening to me and not happening to them? But it's every branch. That's inclusive. Every one of us preachers and all, there's this purging that the, that the husband man does. It says, every branch that beareth fruit, so we're fruitful. We're bringing forth fruit as believers. We're bearing fruit. And then it says, he purgeth it. So why would the husband man purgeth it? Well, the illustration is, of course, grapes and the vine, because he wants it to be fruitful. He wants it to produce more fruit. He's looking at a greater yield, a better yield than the previous year. So there's a purging takes forth, and he gives us the answer that it may bring forth more fruit. So there's fruit, there's no fruit, there's fruit, and there's more fruit. And so the Lord would come then with purging. He wants us to be fruit-bearing, more fruit, much fruit. And I remember reading on one occasion that said that we shrink 
from the purging and pruning, forgetting the gardener who knows the richer, uh, or the, the deeper the cutting and the paring, the richer the cluster that grows. And so God in his great wisdom takes the pruning knife to our lives as believers. And I believe that's the process of sanctification. When we're saved, we're saved by the grace of God. I look back to when I was saved. I was just saved, but I knew nothing. I knew nothing about the Bible. But there were areas in my life where, where God wanted to deal with. There were, there were things in my life that needed to be purged out of my life as a believer, things that are not a great, weren't a great Christian witness, and, and also to, to help me to grow in the faith. And so God starts this work of purging. Paul reminds us in Hebrews 12, 11 about chastening. I believe that's part of the purging process, chastening. Now, Paul says that no chastening for the time, you know, is great, but it's grievous. And it is sore to be chastened and to be chastened of the Lord. But the Lord knows what he's, what he's doing. And when we're chastening, it proves to us that we're God's children because the Lord chasteneth those whom he loveth, Paul says in Hebrews. And the reason that we're chastened by the Lord is that he wants us to bring forth more fruit. Chastening is needful. It's needful because it, it helps us. We need correction and we need growth and we need training. And that chastening rod of the Lord or that pruning knife of God is to train us up to bring us to spiritual maturity. And without chastening, we wouldn't grow. We wouldn't mature. And so God can use our own personal experiences that we've been through for the chastening hand of God. Maybe you're, something has happened in your life, something has come into your life. Does it mean that God is, uh, is not well pleased with you? Well, I don't have all the answers. I certainly have known believers that have gotten away from God, far away from God, and his chastening hand has come in, in, in mighty uh, purging upon them. And I know one dear brother uh, particularly, and he got so far away from God, and God challenged him time and time again until the chastening hand of God fell. And that's what brought him back, and it was a painful process for him. And many of God's children are in the world out there today. They're not all professions of faith. They're genuine men and women who were born again of the Spirit of God, maybe some of your own dear children. And they're far from the Lord today. And God is gracious and God is merciful. And if they're truly born of God's Spirit, there'll be a chastening will come into their lives. And it could be very severe to bring th them back. Many's a child of God was chastened with cancer and brought back to the fold. God only knows what he has to do to chasten these ones. So that's one aspect of chastening, but also for those of us who are walking in fellowship with the Lord. I believe that, that uh, God can work in so many varied and different ways. You know, in my own experience, there are lessons to learn. You could be uh, awake in bed with sickness and God might have something to say. You could be in bed for a fortnight and God will have something to say. Sometimes I believe the problem is not with God's voice. The problem is with our ears. We're not listening. We, we're bad listeners. I see that as a preacher and I'm sure Brother David can relate. You preach your heart out and, you know, at the end of the day, the people are like James. What James says, you look in the mirror, you say, oh, right, oh, that is definitely me. And then you go away and forget. We don't apply the word of God. James says, you're hearers of the word only. But you don't do it. You just love to listen 
But that's as far as it goes. We need to apply. I mean, if you're in a situation in your workplace and your boss come to you with orders and told you what to do, you would have it to do. Or you'd lose your job and you'd lose your money. But when it comes to the things of God, Jesus says, if ye love me, keep my commandments. But we, we don't apply that. We say, yes, Jesus loves me, but I'm doing my own thing. I'm, I'm happy to go my own way. I'm, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to come to church and all. Lord, I, I really do love you, but I really love myself more because I'm doing, my own, I'm doing my own thing. I'm going my own way. I'm keeping my own commandments. And sometimes then the word of God has to come to chasten us. And if we are abiding in this vine and the, the spirit of the Lord is working and moving through our lives, well then, God will want us to bring forth more fruit. And I'm thinking of myself here now, and I'm relating to you, uh, my purging from personal experience, because God has purged my life over the years. I'm not immune. And God has dealt with areas in my life that I could bring forth fruit. Remember then, on one occasion, I was praying. I says, Lord, there's either something wrong with the Bible or there's something wrong with me. Because it says in the Acts of the Apostles that they preached the word of God and there were signs following and people got saved. I says, Lord, I'm preaching the word and I don't see anybody getting saved. There's not much happening. So, Lord, there's either something wrong with the Bible or there's something wrong with me. You'll have to do something with me. So the Lord started that process of chastening. And the Lord started to cut off bits of my life that wasn't pleasing to him and uh, brought me to a place where I was totally isolated then for almost three years. And that's where I was. And he was purging and cutting away and doing a deeper work in my life. And I can look back and I can honestly say that God did a work a deeper work, a purging work, a painful work, a deep work. But now, by the grace of God, as I continue to abide in this vine, I'm seeing fruit in my life, fruit in my ministry. And, and the evidence is that, that God's Spirit is in me. And God's Spirit is working through me till His glory, not anything in me because as he reminded me and I got take you to the very spot in Lurgan Park. I knew that scripture. I had memorized that scripture, but that scripture was only head knowledge to me. I thought it was heart knowledge, but it was only head knowledge. And I can take you to the very spot in Lurgan Park where God spoke that to me into my heart. Without me, ye can do nothing. That move from there, as it were, is 12 inches into here, into my spiritual heart. And that come with such assurance and such a reality of the realization that it's Christ in me and it's Christ in you. And the, unless you abide in the vine of the Lord Jesus, your life as a Christian will bear no fruit. It will not bring forth fruit to the glory of God except you abide in this vine, Christ. And you know, that was a wonderful revelation, but it was painful, but needful. And God did what he had to do in my life. And as I say, the rest history, you know my testimony. But it's the whole key here is to abide. To abide in me. And so there are lessons in all sicknesses, in all everything that affects the believer, good and bad. There are lessons for us to learn if we look for them. God has something to say 
in every situation. There are lessons in all sicknesses. If we seek God, he'll reveal them to us. You remember in finishing Joseph, it says of Joseph, um, Jacob prophesied that Joseph is a fruitful vine whose branches run over the wall. Take what that young man endured. He had revelations from God. He had the visions about the cows, the visions about the moon, the stars, and the bowing down. All these wonderful promises from God as a young man. And yet he was sold into slavery. He was betrayed by his brethren. He was cast into the pit. He had to learn a foreign language. He had to be obedient in a foreign home. He had to abide under a foreign ruler. He had to be subjective unto a foreign nation. And yet through it all, he was put in irons and in fetters. And the Bible says that the irons got into his soul. He was so chastened of God. But when God had finished the purging and the pruning, he raised him up to the second highest position in the kingdom of Egypt, the greatest nation upon earth at that particular time. And Joseph was so refined of God that he was placed in that place of elevation to provide bread for his brethren, to provide bread for the nation, and to proclaim the glory and the goodness of God. How God works. How God moves. How God trains his servants. Look at any man that's been ever, or any woman ever greatly used of God. Look at the trials they have went through to be used. A.W. Tozer says, I doubt if God can use a man at all except he greatly hurts him first. Isn't that amazing? I doubt that God can greatly use a man except he greatly hurts him first. I tell you, there's no pleasure in pruning. There's no pleasure in purging. Can you imagine a little branch saying, oh, please, please no. But the husband man knows what he's doing, that they might bring forth more fruit. And you know what? At the end of the journey, the Bible says your works, your fruit, shall be rewarded. So abide in him and let him words abide in you and you shall bring forth much fruit. Amen.